Bibles and go with me to the book of Job in chapter number 32 tonight. The book of Job in chapter number 32. I'll be honest with you. I really kind of thought I was going to end our study in Job. Like Brother Jack was going to end our study in Job tonight. And I was um, through most of the week planning on ending tonight dealing with our last character in the crisis, the thought was going to be, which would have been God. But I'll save him till the next service that the Lord affords us opportunity to preach. Tonight we have a character that I'd like to introduce to you that the more I got to studying on him and looking at him, just felt like it was appropriate and got the green light from the Lord to add him in to this characters in a crisis. And I mean, why not? He is the man that the Holy Ghost used to author the book of Job. I mean, it's kind of hard to preach about characters in a crisis like we have been. You know, we've preached on Job, we've preached on Satan, preached on Job's wife, preached on Job's three friends. Doesn't really seem right, that, Brother Greg, that we would preach on all the characters in the crisis all the way to the Lord and then leave out the guy who God used to write the book who ends up speaking himself for six straight chapters from chapter 32 to chapter 37 just before the Lord takes over and starts talking. This man's name tonight, our character in the crisis tonight, is a man by the name of Elihu. A man by the name of Elihu. We find him show up in chapter 32 this evening, We'll begin reading in verse number 1, chapter 32, verse number 1. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. From the apparent scripture in verse number 2, I've told you that these days seem to indicate not just from what is said in the scripture, but the men that we find from Job's friends now to Elihu, that this is in the days just after Abraham, sometime around Jacob and Esau's days. That is further illustrated in this man because the Bible said he's the son of Barakel and he is a Buzite. When you go back to Genesis 22 and verse 21, you'll find that Abraham's brother has a son whose name is Buzz. Amen. And uh, this boy here, it would seem to be, is somewhere around Abraham's great, great nephew. Down the line like that. Verse number three. Also, against his three friends was his wrath kindled. Because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Tonight we're going to preach on this man just for a few minutes. And I would dare say, I, I mean, I'll just speak for myself, I've never heard anybody preach on this man before. I would dare say maybe you've never heard a message preached on the author of the book of Job the human penman the Holy Ghost used, whose name is Elihu. You say, preacher, how do you know he wrote it? It's real simple when you read chapter 32 to see that he speaks of himself in first person. It's almost like he steps out of the role of writing about other people and he interjects his mindset. Watch what your Bible said down in verse number 6. It said, Elihu, verse 6, the son of Barakel the Buzite answered and said, I'm young, you're very old, wherefore I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. Watch how he steps out of the narrative for a minute. I said, then he tells you what he said. Look down at verse 10. Therefore I said, hearken to me. Come down to verse number 15. He keeps talking from verse number 10 all the way down through verse 14. Verse 15 he says, they were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking. When I had waited, Elihu speaking, for they spake not but stood still and answered no more. I said, I will answer also my part, so on and so forth. So this boy that we're reading from tonight, 
And I say that because we find he's a young man. We'll deal with that in a little bit. He's a first-hand account eyewitness of what Job went through. Some of the most reliable sources of information will be people who were first-hand eyewitness accounts. Anytime you want to really find out the truth, whether it's your children fussing and fighting, whether it's family fusses and squabbles or whatever, you always say, well, was you there? Well, did you see it? Even in the court of law, they always want eyewitness testimony. That's why the Bible's so amazing. Much of your Bible's written by eyewitness accounts that saw it happen. Matthew writes, and he had walked with the Lord and saw it. Luke and Mark, they got firsthand accounts from the apostles and from Simon Peter and things of this nature. John writes the gospel account. He's a firsthand account of it. And here we find Elihu is a firsthand eyewitness of it and... How and when he shows up is not real clear. He's obviously not one of Job's friends. He's not listed among those three men. But nonetheless, he shows up and begins to give us insight that nobody else did on the story of Job. He say, preacher, it just don't seem like there could be anything that we could get that would help us in an inspirational, devotional, or even doctrinal way from the life of Elihu. If you'll give me about 20, 25 minutes, I promise I believe we'll mine out some things out of Elihu's story in his life that can be a help to all of us young and old tonight. I want to give you three things about Elihu in this character in a crisis and we're done. Number one, I would like to show you Elihu's yearning. Look at his yearning or his desire. Now, now most people malign Elihu and they say that he did the exact same thing to Job that Job's friends did. But I'm here tonight to give you a, a other side to that. He, he doesn't give to Job like his friends do. He, he, his desire, his yearning, and his, his whole point behind him speaking is totally different than Job's friends. Job's friends had a desire simply to prove Job wrong. When Job said he was righteous, they showed up simply to prove Job wrong, and in proving Job wrong, they wanted to build themselves up that they were right. And he doesn't speak like Job speaks, because bless old brother Job's heart, he tries to justify himself, and then he tries to bring God down, and he tries to really blame God for the situation and the problem that he's in over and over. You say, well, what is his yearning? What does he show up to say? Why is he different than Job's friends and he's different than Job? What's what his whole point behind why he shows up is? Verse number 2 of chapter 32. It said this fellow's wrath was kindled. Watch the last part of verse 2. Against Job was his wrath kindled because... He justified himself rather than God. Watch why he's mad at Job's friends. Verse 3, against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now, what you'll find is when you read the six chapters, chapter 32 through chapter 37, this is what you'll find. This fellow mentions God in some shape, form, or fashion 80 times in six chapters. 80 times in six chapters, he references the Lord. Y'all, that's better than 13 times a chapter. Better than 13 times a chapter, he is lifting God up, praising God, glorifying God, exalting God, putting God way up high on a pedestal. Whereas Job is blaming God and pulling him down and exalting himself and pushing himself up. And whereas Job's friends are just trying to tear Job down so they can build their self up, that's not Elihu's goal at all. His soul desire, his soul yearning is I want God to get all the praise. I want God to get all the glory. I want God to get all the honor. He says the sole reason why I've interjected
interjected myself in the story and why I've showed up is I want God to get maximum honor, maximum praise, and maximum glory. And as he has listened to Job and his three friends, nobody has stepped up in defense of God. So Elihu says, if nobody else is going to come to the aid of God, I will step up and defend my God if I have to do it all by myself tonight. And watch, he, he can't keep it in. He wants to exalt God so bad and put man down so bad, he can't even keep it in. Come down to verse 19, chapter 32. Watch what he said in verse 19 of our text. Watch what he says. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. This old boy says, I got to say something on behalf of God or I'm going to bust. I've got to say something about how wonderful he is, how good he is, how mighty he is, what a savior he is, what a creator he is, what a deliverer he is, what a mighty God he is. And if I don't, I feel like I'm going to burst. I don't know about you. There have been times in a testimony service or in a worship service or you may have been standing around a bunch of reprobate heathens at work. They all got to cussing God and downing God and son, something inside of you said, I got to say something. I got to speak up on behalf of God. I can't not say something. I got to say something. I want the Lord to have the glory. Can I say tonight it'd be good if God would give us all an overwhelming yearning and an overwhelming desire for God to get glory out of our lips and out of our lives tonight. I wonder if while you're at work, if while you're at church, if while you're at school, if God is getting any kind of glory out of your life tonight. He deserves it and he demands it. You ought to go home and read chapter 32 through chapter 37. You say, preacher, that's six chapters. I know, but I mean, it ain't just like two or three pages. It won't hurt you none. Put the Super Bowl on pause and read it. And the more you read this, the more you find out, Brother Kevin, this old boy ain't doing nothing but lifting God up, lifting God up, talking about God, telling him about what God's doing. It is the yearning of his soul. I want God to have the glory. I wonder if that's the yearning of your life. I wonder if the goal of your life is God in whatever state I'm in, in whatever situation I'm in, in whatever's going on in my life, God, I want you to get the glory out of my life. Brother, that's what he deserves out of your life. And I wonder when you look around your life, is there anything or anywhere in your life that would indicate God's getting any kind of glory out of you? Or are you stuck back in chapters 3 through 31, trashing other people, bringing God down to your level, and lifting yourself up? Because there's a whole lot of that that goes along and around. There's a whole lot of people, I'm talking about saved people. Job's a saved man. His three friends are a saved man. But in the heat of the moment, they are slinging mud at each other, bringing God down to their level, and lifting their self up to a high level. God forbid at Bible Missionary Baptist Church we ever try and humanize God and deify man or constantly sling mud at each other. Our sole goal and our sole desire and the yearning of our heart when we walk in them doors and when we walk out of those doors should be God get the glory out of my life. I got to hurry. We not only see his yearning, but we also see his youth. <laughs> young people, I want y'all to tune in now. I want all these young people to tune in here for just a minute. Look at his youth. Watch what your Bible said in verse 4 of chapter 32. Verse 4, chapter 32. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken. Because they were elder than he. Look down at verse 6. And Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. For 30 chapters, Brother David, this fellow has sat back in the weeds, and he's a young man. 
and he has listened to them misunderstand and malign God. He has listened to them justify themselves and bloviate about how wonderful they are and how righteous they are and about how they do this and they don't do that. And brother, he has listened to so much till finally he surprises them all when he says, I got something to say. See, brother Randy, they just figure it like this. They just figure this boy ain't got the guts nor the courage nor the God about him to stand up and say anything after everything that we have said. But thank God for a young man. I don't know how old he is, but the Bible says he's young. Thank God for a young person that says, I have had a gutful of people tearing my God down. I have had a gutful of people lifting themselves up. I have had all I can take of God being questioned and flesh being exalted for 30 chapters. I am done going with the flow. I am done just riding like a dead fish downstream. And if nobody else is willing to stand up and defend the Lord, I will stand up and defend the Lord. Now, I want all you young people here to listen to me. This world mocks your God. This world trashes your God. This world constantly mars the tent reputation of your God. This world trashes the church and slings mud at the church and tries to humanize God and deify man. And you know what they expect? This is what the world expects. They expect Well, there ain't no young person going to go against us. Oh, it might be them old fuddy-duddies down there, 40 and over crowd down at the church, but there ain't nobody 30 and down going to go against us because we provide their entertainment. We provide their music. We provide their clothes. We provide their fun. They won't go against us. But God give us, hallelujah, God give us some Elihu's that have about had it up to here with all the garbage that world's throwing out and would get them a good full and would stand up and say enough is enough. I'm tired of hearing you cuss my God. I'm tired of hearing you give him down the road. If I have to be the one voice crying in the wilderness, I'll stand right by myself. But I'm going to give God some glory in my life, whether anybody else does or not. It's high time we have some young ladies and some young men of character that'll make their mind up. I'm on the Lord's side. I'm on his side. about even some young people that'll get fed up at the modern religious movements in our day. Let me tell all you young people something. I want y'all to listen up and listen to time. If I was all you young people in here, I would be offended that churches think they have to have a contemporary service to make me feel good at church. I'd be offended to know that leaders at churches think, oh, they won't come for real worship and real church. So God bless you, you little simple-minded doofus. God bless y'all little idiots. God bless y'all little worldlings. God bless y'all little flesh-eating monsters. Tell you what we'll do. We'll give you a dim light show. We'll dress down. We'll smoke it out. We'll rock it out because y'all can't handle real church. I'd be flipping offended. I'm going to tell you this. When I got saved and born again at 18, I found out this. There ain't no such thing as a junior Holy Ghost. And we don't have to have a separate service for these kids and give them some cheap plastic knockoff of the real thing so that they get a hold of the things of God. They're more than capable of worshiping God in spirit and in truth and enjoying preaching and giving God glory in the singing and singing in the choir. We don't have to have some light show, smoke show, rap show. We need some youngins that'll stand up and say enough's enough enough's enough enough with all this garbage I'm walking with God yeah I'd I'd be I'm telling you this they didn't have a lot of that stuff when I was younger but I'd be flat up indignant if I was y'all at that trash 
because that's what it is. They think that y'all aren't spiritual enough to enjoy this. <laughs> I got news for them. This still works. This still works? And it's still right? And I don't care how many of them walk a different way. It's still the right way. And it's still good. We don't have to have a service for the old folk and a service for the young folk. We don't have to have one traditional, one contemporary. Last I checked, he's the God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. We don't need double tonight. And let me tell you all this. I'm talking about Elihu, a young man that finally says, enough's enough. Tired of hearing y'all trash my God and lift yourself up. Need some young people to make their mind up. I'm sick of them pushing that junk at the Grammys down my throat. I'm sick of them dressing up like a bunch of harlots and a bunch of homosexuals, transgender garbage, and then shove it down my throat and, I, and act like I'm just going to sit here and say, mm, mm, thank you, give me some more. Mm, mm. Well, what's wrong with you? Yeah, what's wrong with you tonight? How about some young people that'll stand up against that trash? How about some young people that'll stand up at school and say, teacher, God bless you, and you may give me an F, but we didn't come from monkeys. And I'll put the, and I'll put the answers down on this paper because that's what I got to do to get the grade. But I'll let you know, I'm going to do it under protest. Yeah. I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm a standing on the inside, praise God. Yeah. Don't let you know we didn't come from a monkey or a tadpole or an ape. We come from a holy sovereign God who put us here. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want to let y'all know I love you, but there ain't two genders. There's just, there ain't, ain't multiple genders. There's only two genders. I love you, but I want you to know all this stuff you're peddling my way. I mean, brother, we've lost our mind. Yeah. You say, you say, oh, preacher, you just go a little extreme. Stuff ain't really happening like you say. You can come talk to this boy after to church. Yeah. Brother, in his school, what school you go to? South Rowan High there you School. Go. South, we're talking about South Rowan High School, Brother Jack. They got youngins crawling around on all fours acting like animals. Right. Yeah. And they're in the process of putting, tell me if I'm wrong, they're in the process of putting litter boxes in the bathroom for them to use. Yeah. 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 You're right. We've lost our mind. Yeah. And you know why? Because we've lost this generation. Amen. We need some Elihu's that'll grab a hold of this and say, I'm with God, and I don't mind being numbered with the Lord. Call me weird, call me backwards, but I'm with the Lord. Speak up, push back. Thank God there was a young man named David that when nobody else would walk out on a battlefield, there was a young man that had a heart full of God and a little sling and slung a rock and took a big man down, Brother Jason. Thank God down yonder in Babylon when everybody else was bowing to the king, there was a little boy named Daniel that said, I purposed in my heart, I won't eat the king's meat nor drink the king's wine. Thank God when everybody else was a-dancing down at the party at Nebuchadnezzar's show, they was three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that said we ain't bowing, we ain't boogieing, and we ain't going to burn either. Thank God there's some young people that still want to do right. Now I'm telling you, nobody bats a thousand. In our church, in our generation, it's no different. Everybody ain't going to live for God, young people. But make your mind up, you're going to. Everybody ain't gonna. But make your mind up. You're gonna. I see his yearning. I see his youth. Can I say one more thing? And I'm gonna turn you, well, I ain't gonna turn you loose. I got something to tell you after church. I ain't gonna lie to you, praise God. His yearning, his youth. Then I like this. We see his yielding. His yielding. So what do you mean his yielding? Let me say it like this. A yearning to please God and glorify God 
will always result in a yielding to God's will. Please do not come and tell me, well, I love the Lord and I really want him to get glory out of my life. That's my desire. That's my yearning. But then your life shows no yielding to what he said. See, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You say, what does this boy yield to, preacher? What's the yielding that this boy yields to? Brother Michael Holsauser, this boy yields to the Holy Ghost. I love this. I love this. And God, out of his yielding, gives us 42 chapters of the book of Job. Who does God choose, Brother James, to undertake the big work of writing the oldest book in the Bible that has helped so many of us down through the ages? Who does God choose to do this? He chooses a young man who has a yearning to please God and is willing to yield himself to the hand of God on his life. Just one person with a yearning that will then turn that into a yielding. There is no telling what God could do with your life. Just one person that would say, have thine own way, Lord. I, I, my desire is your glory in my life, not mine, yours. And now I'm yielding to you and doing what you say. You know, tell them what God could do with you. Can I say there's something else, a blessing about his yielding? You know what happens when you yield to God? You become a blessing to others. So, Brother Chad, not only is Elihu a blessing to us because we have the book of Job. Now, I'll just ask you this, just offhand, and I'm going to give you the second reason why him yielding is a blessing. How many of y'all have personally been helped, impacted, or blessed by the 42 chapters of Job at some point in your life? Raise your hand. I know I have. Hold them up. Hold them up. Don't put them down. Don't put them down. Look around, y'all. That's everybody in this room. Elihu is still being a blessing, though he's been dead for thousands of years. Elihu's still reaching out and touching people because he had a desire to please God. You say, what else is there a blessing out of his yielding? Not only that he reached out and he's a blessing, but listen to me. You have no idea... Who you yielding to God, you are going to be an answer to prayer in their life. Amen. So what do you mean by that, preacher? Do you realize this? Brother Mike Stogner just blessed me today. Elihu is an answer to prayer to Job. So wait, where, where did Job ever pray for Elihu to stand up and do anything? Go to, go to chapter 19. Watch what Job asks the Lord Job chapter 19. Elihu is an answer to prayer because he was yearning and yielded. Job 19, verse 23. Job 19, 23. Job is asking God, Oh, that my words were now written. <laughs> Y'all check it out. Oh, that they were printed in a book. <laughs> that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock. I like this word. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word. <laughs> Job said, I just wish somebody would write this down. And you want to know something? I'm not sure Job ever saw it. And while Job was in the middle of his trial, he had no idea God was working on a young boy's heart to be the answer to his prayer. Some of y'all sitting in here tonight in the middle of your crisis, you're praying and saying, God, please do this. God, please do that. God, help me here. And you think God's not listening and you think God's not coming through. That's what Job thought in Job 19. But God was working and God was moving and God was using the most unlikely of sources to bring Job's prayer to pass. You keep praying. You keep begging God. You keep lifting your request. You may forget it, but there's a God who doesn't forget. There's a God who's listening. There's a God who's answering. 
And if you'll keep being yearning and yielded, maybe God will use you to be the one that answers someone else's prayer. So you say, what, what are we talking about tonight, preacher? I'm talking about a young man named Elihu who just had a yearning for the glory of God and got himself yielded and spoke up in the midst of everybody else going crazy. And if you'll just make your mind up tonight, Esther, help me over here. If you'll just make your mind up tonight that you're going to yield yourself to the Lord, walk with God, there's no telling what the Lord will do in your life. Young people, make your mind up tonight. Settle it in your heart. Get around this altar and say, Lord, I'm going to be an Elihu for my generation. A voice in my generation that says, enough is enough. The devil doesn't have them all. And I'm going to be one that he doesn't have. Thank God for this man in the crisis. Y'all, we're in a crisis today. We're living in a crisis of our country. What do we need? Some people, not just young people, some people, period, who have a yearning, yielded life to the things of God. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray you'd bless the simple message from the Word of God. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for making it real, relevant, and alive in our life. I want to say thank you for Elihu. I look forward to meeting some of these Bible characters one day. God, when I see Elihu, I'll shake his hand and say thank you. Thank you for being a yielded life. Your book that God used you to write sure did help a whole lot of people, including me. God, I pray that you would use our life to be the answer to prayer in someone else's life. But we got to speak up. We can't just give lip service. We've got to give hip service. Help us to walk with you and serve you and be that generation that lives for God till Jesus comes. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, if you need to come, you come.